preparation for our interview with Julius McCurdy, Decatur, Georgia, November 18th. So I guess we could really start. I know you were and moved to Decatur around 1913 or thereabouts. Maybe we could just begin by um, something of your own background and education. You may have to cut that off if my that's fine. I was born near Stone Mountain, Georgia, and moved to Tequila at the age of nine on January one, nineteen thirteen. My father had been elected sheriff the previous year, and the law at that time required that the sheriff live in the jail. So we moved to the jail and stayed there for about 11 years. I, uh, at an early age, began working part-time in the sheriff's office and knew most of the judges and lawyers you cut that a minute? Sir. Excuse me, when I raise my hand, I like cutting. Uh, at that time, DeKalb County was largely a rural county, and the area consisted of small 50 to 100 acre farms. There were several small towns. The only pavement was in the cities, the first road to be paved in the county was the old Stone Mountain Road, which is now West Ponce de Land Avenue. At that time, there were three industries in the county. The largest individual industry was Scottsdale Mills. Then the Virginia Carolina Chemical Company on the Georgia Railroad in what was then known as Edgewood, and then the granite industries at Stone Mountain and Lithonia. They were very busy at that time and employed a great many men. M many of the people who worked in the quarries were Welshmen and Scottish people. All right. I worked at Camp Gordon one summer as an office boy. Camp Gordon was a large military cantonment that was built to train soldiers for World War I. It was located on the Claremont Road at that time. The pavement ended in the Kida. The rest of the road was unpaved and frequently impassable because of rain. On finishing high school, I attended Emory University. At that time, the pavement stopped at about where the YMCA is, and we had to get to Emory, uh, sometimes by going around through Druid Hills and Little Water Road. After graduating from Emory College and law school, I opened my law office in the Masonic Temple Building in Nikita. Shortly thereafter, I was approached to uh, help some of the business people organize a building and loan association which is now known as the Cato Federal Savings and Loan Association. I retired from the law practice about 55 and accepted the presidency of the Cato Federal, later becoming chairman of the board. But following my, uh, opening my law office, I was appointed by Mr. Charles A. Matthews as county attorney 
And when he died in 1939, Scott Candler was elected and to succeed him, and he continued me as the county attorney. The county at that time was governed by a single commissioner and had been since the turn of the century. That was changed in 53 or 54 to a multi-board with the chairman serving as executive officer. Soon after Mr. Candler was elected, he was approached by the General Motors to help locate a, the, what was then known as the BOP plant at Shamley. One of their requirements was that they must have adequate water. At that time, Mr. Candler, who had been mayor of Decatur, negotiated a lease for the Decatur water system and brought a 30-inch line from the Chattahoochee River first to a settling uh, basin and after that, a treatment plant, and after that, down Claremont Road to Decatur to connect up with the Decatur system. In order to obtain sufficient revenue to support the bond issue, he had to also get the customers uh, that lived in Druid Hills. Some of those customers had been served under a contract with the city of Atlanta. The attorney for the uh, bond people decided that the contract with the city of Atlanta was unconstitutional because it was unilateral, and he agreed to give an opinion to that effect. Therefore, we branched off a line from uh, the Claremont line and extended the line along North Decatur Road to connect with the Atlanta lines. And just before we started to make the connection, the city of Atlanta filed a suit in the Cab County to enjoin our uh, action in disconnecting their lines. This case went to the Supreme Court and was decided in favor of the Cab County. Consequently, the Cab County then served all of the Druid Hills area, which was in, in the Cab County. I'm sure Mayor Hartsfield didn't like that very much. <laughs> we waited. We didn't want to file a suit in Fulton. This is just right. We didn't want to file a suit in Fulton County. We wanted to have them file it out here. So you were waiting for them to file a suit? Yeah. How did you find that loophole in the legal agreement between uh, Druid Hills and Well, Santa they Island? reserved the right to disconnect or discontinue the water service any time they had a demand in Atlanta, which they couldn't meet, which meant that the contract was one-sided. They, 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 uh, Druid Hills was obligated to buy water from them, but they were not obligated all the time to sell it. That meant it was a unilateral contract and consequently okay. was not, could not be enforced. You realized that, how did that, how did you realize that you needed to get Druid Hills in the, in the first place? Well, we knew how much the, uh, how many bonds we were going to issue and what the terms were and how much we had to pay. So we had to obtain enough revenue to pay that uh, interest and principal on the bonds. Now, had Mr. Matthews done anything about a water system before Scott Candler? He had considered it, but he had not been able to uh, get Decatur to agree to it. Mr. Candler had been mayor of Decatur for many years and had the inside uh, voice, uh, inside connections, which enabled him to negotiate the contract with the city of Decatur. And Another reason he was able to do it is because the Decatur's water supply was becoming insufficient to meet the needs. They were obtaining their water from Peachtree Creek, 
uh, which runs just north of Decatur. And that supply was running very low. And then at what point did you actually turn on the water to Druid Hills? Was it after the lawsuit or? No, we turned it on before the lawsuit. And uh, I, now I'm not sure about this, I can't remember, but I think the courts refused the injunction. The courts out here refused the injunction, which let us connect. Then Atlanta made the appeal. If it were on the appeal, all we had to do was disconnect. Mm -hmm. If it landed one, we just had to disconnect. So it happened more or less the way that you had envisioned that it yeah. would happen. Mm -hmm. And how, how did you and Mr. Candler work together in, in all of this? We worked together on just uh, the best of terms. He conferred with me when he thought he needed advice. And when he didn't think he needed any advice, he acted on his own. Uh, he was a very uh, forceful man and had, uh, had a vision for the county, having served as mayor of Decatur for many years. But it was the General Motors offer or, or opportunity that actually prompted the development of the water system. That's right. Uh, we wanted to plan out here for tax reasons, and uh, that would increase our tax base substantially. And of course, that started the, the Peachtree Industrial Area. And following the VOP plant location, there were many others that followed that. And that was the first industrial area in DeKalb County. Uh, then others began to develop. And now there are, there are many industries in several different industrial areas. Sure. Now, I that time was that water system a countywide system? No. We had contemplated simply bringing the water line to serve larger than the northern part of the county and the city of Decatur. But of course after they were located then the other parts of the county began to demand water service too and we had to enlarge the uh, water lines coming out of the Chattahoochee. We built a coffer dam on the Chattahoochee, which just, it didn't fully obstruct the flow of the water, but it turned enough in to uh, fill our reservoir. And uh, as far as I know, except for this last summer, there never has been a real shortage of water in the Cap County. And it now serves, the water system covers practically the entire county. Of course, following that, the, the demand for sewer service also began to develop, and uh, the county undertook to do that, issuing bonds from time to time to take care of it. And uh, that's about it. So, How did you so we do not have water and sewer service over, I would imagine, at least three fourths of the county. What did you have to go through to get the dam? up there. No, they had to buy some land in John in the river. In Fulton County. Or, or was it in the Is it, Yes, I believe it's in Northern Fulton. Okay. And so the bond issue went for construction of the dam as well as that yes. system. That's but right. you used uh, WPA uh, funds to help actually construct the system, isn't it? No. no. Uh, WPA is about uh, Finished. Now, one thing we did with WPA, we built the airport okay. uh, on land which had been public land. Camp Gordon. Camp Gordon. Uh, and we built the airport there largely with WPA labor. Okay. But the sewer, the water systems were not really concerned? No, they were con primarily uh, public, the cab county funds, okay. barred funds. Now, in all of this, I've heard that there were three people involved, yourself, Mr. Candler, and Country O'Neill. Maybe you could describe Country O'Neill a little bit. Country O'Neill was quite a character. He at first worked as cashier of the, it was called Bank of Decatur then, later became Decatur Bank and Trust Company. And they closed during the Depression. And uh, he was employed by Mr. Candler as sort of his right-hand man at uh, anything that uh, Mr. Candler wanted him to do, he would 
do it. For instance, we put a health center over in Indicator near the depot. DeKalb County couldn't buy land on a credit. That is, they couldn't make a loan, get a loan to buy land with. And so Scott had Country O'Neill buy the land, put the loan on it, and then deed it to the county, and the county had made, made the payments. This, the thing of that kind is that uh, he was just willing to do anything Scott asked him to right. do. Right. I think I heard the story that somebody said that if uh, Scott Candler had asked Stone Mountain to be chopped up, Country O'Neill would have said, where's the shovel up. or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, you mentioned Scott's vision for the county. Maybe you could describe that vision and then how it worked out in different Well, parts. one of the things, uh, Emory University announced uh, that their hospital would become a close hospital because they wanted to concentrate their efforts on teaching. That left the county without any hospital and with the doctors that had been on the staff were they were not taken off. They kept those on, but they didn't add in new ones. Uh, consequently, we just didn't have any sort of hospital in the county. Uh, Dr. Rufus Evans was uh, the first uh, health doctor we had in the county, and he had realized the problem, and he began to make efforts to build a hospital, and we negotiated the bond issue to build at Cab General Hospital. And it's also and in the 40s, too? Yes, I was in the 40s. Uh, well, maybe the 50s. Okay. I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. I was on the first board mm -hmm. uh, that was created. Dr. J.R. McKean, president of Agnes Scott College, was the chairman. And he was very forceful and insisted that we get enough land to meet our needs. and. That's proven very valuable because the, the hospital has grown, and uh, we've had enough land there to to make additions to the hospital and provide parking and all that. That was separate from the Fulton the Cab Hospital Authority. No, I'll tell you about that. Uh, Grady Memorial was first owned and operated by the city of Atlanta. Uh, they wanted to build a new hospital. That the other one was old and antiquated. It did, it did not meet the needs of the county of, Fulton, uh, of Atlanta. So there was organized the Fulton DeKalb Hospital Authority, in which the two counties agreed to issue bonds and to pay back in uh, the had their own tax ratio to and to uh, have members appointed by the Fulton County Commission and by the Cab County Commission to serve on the board. Uh, uh, King and Spalding were the attorneys for the hospital. They were very influential in, in helping with the uh, arranging for the financing. And that hospital is now operated by by Fulton and Cab County continues to serve the needs of those who can't pay for hospital service. Now, when we built the Cab General, the question came up about what to do with those patients. The government participated in the financing of the hospital at that time, I mean the federal government, and they required that you do a certain amount of uh, work for those who were unable to pay. We made an agreement with the Fulton the Cab Hospital Authority to send some patients or to allow us to treat some patients and uh, continue the same procedures that we were carrying on at Fulton the Cab Hospital Authority. So that you would continue to receive federal? Yeah. Who took the lead in developing the Fulton the Cab uh, Hospital Authority? Wait just a minute now. I've got to think. Mr. Hughes followed in. Okay. And then on their board, the chairman of the trust company board at that time, I'm trying to say, Nemo Company. 
uh, Strickland? No, it was before him. Uh, oh, he, had, he lived in Cab County, on, in, up on Parkland Avenue. Okay, well, maybe we can shift the question a bit. Uh, why was there the need for a, an authority of that kind to be set up at that point? When the city had been operating Grady before. Well, in order to uh, get the Fulton County residents in the picture and the DeKalb County residents in the picture, you had to set up an entirely different organization. You wouldn't want the city of Atlanta to run it or Fulton County to run it or DeKalb County to run it. So the three of them got together and agreed on this Fulton Cab Hospital Authority and they set up the terms uh, for of the amount that Fulton County and DeKalb County would contribute. So it's a financial question to raise the money for the new building. That's right. That prompted it. It was beyond the means of the city to handle it at that point. Well, they were. One of the reasons is there were a lot of bootlegging going in. Residents of Fulton County who couldn't pay for being, they'd carry them to some resident in Atlanta and bootleg them into the hospital. Okay. We did a little bit of that too. And so it was reasonable to handle, handle it by the two counties. And then you could serve all of them, with every, all of the residents of the two counties. Was there Not any, any problem? Was there any resistance either on the DeKalb end or the Fulton no, end toward uh -uh, that kind of thing? No, it, everybody recognized the need for it, and I don't recall any opposition to it. And as far as you can recall, is 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 this really the first sort of joint county effort that takes place in the in the hospital authority, or is there anything else that before that time? I don't. I don't recall one. Okay. And that, that's, if I'm not mistaken, right around World War II. It was built after, I believe, after World War II because you couldn't do very much right. during, during the but war. But the authority was created. The authority was created. Everything was ready to go as soon as we were able to uh, build. You know, during the war, there was practically no building. And uh, you didn't have a manpower office of it. But... Uh, Soon after the war, uh, it was started and has completed and now seems to have outgrown itself a little bit. Mm -hmm. Was that part of the, there was the, I know there was a big bond issue in 1946 or so, was that, did that include um, the Grady Hospital bonds? I don't recall the specific about that. Now as far as DeKalb, getting back to DeKalb at that point, um, I guess right around that time, um, I saw some mention of a constitutional amendment that would enable the appointment of a countywide school superintendent and school board. Uh, that I guess eventually led to Mr. Cherry being a superintendent. Oh. They, uh, I'm not quite as familiar with that. I think that the board. I really don't know. I, okay. I think maybe the board may be elected now, and they appoint the, county, the school superintendent. Okay. Prior to that time, the school superintendent was an officer and was elected, uh, and, and the board was appointed just to su supervise. Now the board is the governing authority, and the school superintendent is its agent. Um, we were fortunate in the Cab County at that time to have Scott Cannon as commissioner and Jim Cherry as superintendent of school. Both of them were very forceful men and uh, they had the best interest of the county. They strictly were not politicians. Mr. Cherry came out of the state superintendent's office to help out when we had a very weak superintendent and then he ran for post the next year was elected. And then after then, provision was made for his appointment. Okay. The uh, DeKalb County continued to grow through all of that period. One of the main factors, I think, was the high educational uh, institutions located in DeKalb. The first was Emory University, which moved 
Emory College up to uh, its present campus. And uh, it has greatly expanded during the years. Uh, Agnes Scott College is the oldest, and it was located in Nikita before the turn of the century. Uh, Overthorpe University was located in the cab uh, sometime probably in the 20s. And uh, after that, Columbia, the seminary, the Presbyterian Ministerial College was located in the county. So uh, those institutions uh, brought a lot of good citizens to the county for one thing, and those citizens took a uh, an active part in the affairs of the county. I remember Dr. J. Sam Guy was uh, chairman of the county school board for many years. He was on the faculty of Emory University. Uh, Mr. McCain. Dr. McCain. Dr. McCain, as president of Agnes Scott, took a very active part in, in all the affairs of the county. This is a little bit of an aside, but do you recall anything about a professor over here at Agnes Scott, Arthur Raper? Professor of Sociology? No. Sort of a controversial figure yeah. there. You know, mm -mm. I don't recall that. Okay. Well, we're talking in the 40s, there is this cooperation on the hospital authority, but there's also very clearly a, a separate water system, separate sewer system, and what has been called the Iron Curtain at Moreland Avenue between uh, one very strong person, Mayor Hartsfield, on one side, and another very forceful man, Scott Candler, on the other side yeah. of Moreland Avenue. And I was wondering sort of how that, how that evolves as we move toward the plan of improvement. Well, I, I think that uh, uh, those two men, although they were forceful, they, they, they didn't have any, any real rips. They, 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 they got along fairly well. There possibly one or two little differences between them. but. Another thing Scott did, which I think is very important, was he was responsible for the acquiring Stone Mountain for a state park. Mm -hmm. He first thought about acquiring it for the, by the county, but soon realized it was going to be too big an undertaking for the county, and he promoted the idea of the state taking it over. Going to the, through and, the legislature. Yes, went through the legislature and the state. Uh, provided funds to acquire it with. Was that a problem getting it through the legislature? No. I don't recall any objections to it. I know Jekyll Island, not too many years before, had been kind of a controversial yeah. acquisition by the state. That's what right. It? But I don't recall any problem with so mine Park. Of course, it has developed into a much larger park than was envisioned when it was first acquired. Who had the How did the idea come about to set well, up? Well, the idea came about originally with a private association, the Stone Mountain Memorial. Memorial Association. And they undertook to raise money. One way was by selling the Stone Mountain half dollars for a dollar. And, but uh, it, it just proved too big an undertaking for the uh, funds to be raised at that time, especially when uh, we were just probably not out of the depression when, when it was first considered. And uh, the Venerable Brothers who owned Stone Mountain had first agreed to convey to the association without any cost just, just the sheer face of the steep side of the mountain and not any land or any, any, the, any of the quarries. But, uh, and they, they were working on that basis. And then when the state became involved, Scott and I had some little part in worked uh, with the owners in trying to get them to, to sell the land to the state. We'd worked out of terms and all of them were agreeable except one. It took us quite a little while to get that worked out. What was, what was that one term? I think it was Ms. Roper. She was one of the heirs. See, the two original Venable brothers had died, and one of them, Sam Venable, had not married, and so he left a, a number of nieces and nephews. I see. 
So you actually had to go with each one of the heirs to, yeah, to get their parcel of the of the land. Their their undivided uh, interest in the land. And what what work did you have to do at the legislative end or with the governor at that point? Well, we the bill was introduced, I guess, by uh, our members of the legislature from the cab. Ms. And I don't remember who the members yeah. were at that time. There were only three. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I can't remember who they were. And the governors, whoever was governor. Probably Talmadge, I guess. Might have been Talmadge. He worked. Uh, maybe maybe Griffin, maybe, or Vandiver. No, it, it was full Vandiver, I'm sure. It's either Griffin or, or Talmadge. Griffin or Talmadge. And uh, they were, they, well, I think they saw I realize that it would be a great benefit to the state. And I have heard that it now draws the third largest group of visitors, the first two being with the Disneyland, hands, one in California and one in Florida. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, but, and so you're saying that even though there were only three um, legislators from DeKalb, and DeKalb was considered an urban county, you still have to, could get it through the legislature for Oh, it. yes. We didn't have any problem. Okay. Now, there are problems once the association is established, if I'm not correct. Uh, there are questions about the nature of development and the use of state. Oh, there was, there was quite some little differences there. And uh, there was some question about uh, or oh, a hotel that was built down there. The I remember that right. there was some, yeah. something came up about that. The, what was the name of the, uh, the name of the... Um, Stone Mountain Inn, I think. Right. I can't remember the name of the uh, actual contractor for it. Rutland, I believe. I think... Uh, Borgo or something? Uh, cool. Yeah, I don't have any. The, uh, Uh, Mr. McQuitter, I believe, was the manager then. McQuitter had been on the Public Service Commission for a long time. And then later on, uh, they appointed Scott after he was defeated here as commissioner. And he served for a while. As the? As, as the manager of the park. Okay. So he replaced uh, McQuitter? McQuitter, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. They continued to work together, Mr. McQuitter and Scott were down there together. The, P, the PSC, the Public Service Commission, sent had a representative on the Stone Mountain um, Memorial Association yes, all that's the time. Right. Secretary of State also said, okay. and the Commission of Agriculture Bill said, Campbell. Yeah. and there were three, I believe three people from outside of government. Uh, Mills Lane was one of them. Mills, uh, Mills served right at the beginning, but wow. he didn't stay very long. Uh, Mills was was extremely helpful in in trying to get things going. If if they needed some money and they didn't have it, he'd advance it. And that happened. Oh yes, once or twice, I think. Okay. And then who else from the private sector? Uh, I don't remember in the early days. Now I served on it for about four years, uh, just before. Oh, who's the man with the restaurant? Lester Maddox. Lester Maddox. Uh, Lester Maddox appointed somebody to take my place. So you were appointed by Carl Sanders. Yes. Or, okay. Mm -hmm. huh. And then, what about the construction of the Stone Mountain Freeway? And I, I don't know anything about that except this, the state uh, had had planned the freeway and did construct a large part of it. And I think that freeway was originally intended to tie into what they called the Carter Presidential, Presidential Parkway. Parkway. But uh, people objected to it and finally got into politics never did get it connected up. I think it would have served a useful purpose because it would taken a lot of traffic off of the other streets in, in the area. 
I heard something about the contractors on that freeway actually purchasing the land to enable it to go through. I, I don't know. Do you? I don't know anything any about, that. about that. Okay. Uh, and then what kind of? Uh, you said there were differences or there were de debates within the association. What what kinds of things were you re referring to? Well, that was prior to my time, and I really don't know. Okay. I just know there was some some differences between some of them at the time. Uh -huh. When I was on it, everything went very smoothly. And you were the secretary treasurer of for a while, time. yes. Because they needed require your signature to sign off on the bonds. I'd go to New York and sign a whole lot of bonds. Okay. <laughs> they, I think. Uh, 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 the obligations on the bond have always been met out of the revenues of the park. And what was the story on the um, proposed truck terminal over here in Tucker? Wasn't there some issue there, a bond, bond related issue? Not sure. The, devel what? the development of the truck terminal? Uh -uh. Okay. I don't know anything about that. Okay. And there is a large. Uh, development of uh, industrial development okay. along what's called the Stone Mountain Industrial Area. Uh, that's been developed rather recently, primarily by a man named H.G. Patilla, sure. who's a young man, but he's... That's an old Decatur family. Yes. Yeah. And he, part of that used to be some Decatur land that he bought to start with. and. Uh, He has, he has really, you go from this Georgia Railroad here up and across the uh, Seaboard Railroad mm -hmm. on that industrial boulevard runs into the Jimmy Carter Boulevard at, at, mm -hmm. the, at, at the Gwinnett Cross. County line. It's going to be a good little ways from Norcross. Yeah. Right up there, though. Yeah. There was a, one other thing I wanted to ask before I get into another matter. Um, what was the tax equalization program that Scott Cantler and you introduced in the early 50s? Something about the taxes in the county? Well, uh, I think that originated. We'd been to a meeting with Scott and Jim Sherry and I were right back and were discussing the, the problem. And rather than increase the the rate, they thought it might be well to reevaluate the property in the county. And a thorough study was made of it and found that a great deal of property was undervalued. And so the result was an uh, increase in the digest of just about 100%. Uh, and uh, of course, that, that created quite a lot of uh, unrest as far as people were concerned that, that had the taxes raised, and most people did have. But uh, it was either to do that or, or raise the rate about the same amount to take care of the additional things which the county had taken on, like, that, like the hospital. and. Uh, uh, the school system was, with the influx of people that we'd had, was just overcrowded, and uh, new buildings had to be built there. And you had to have funds to meet the debt service. And that was, I think, along in 48 or 49, maybe 50. And it worked out all right. <laughs> what kind of opposition did you have at that? You didn't have much except, uh, I guess, maybe may have been some organization, I don't remember. Of course, people went before the tax assessor, and uh, that's the that's right they all have if they feel the property is over-assessed. And uh, there was they, no it stayed fairly, fairly well. We, the, the digest was just about double. Uh -huh. There are no lawsuits brought against I don't recall. No, I don't believe there was. Okay. 
Um, again, we kind of got off this a little while ago, but maybe you could talk about uh, your relationship to the plan of improvement and the different annexation plans of the city of Atlanta you know, in the late 40s and early 50s. Well, you kind of got me lost. Well, let me ask you this I don't way. Remember. To, to what degree was the development of a countywide water system and sewer system a, an attempt to uh, ward off uh, annexation by the city of Atlanta at that time? <coughs> I don't think it had anything to do with it. <coughs> I think. <coughs> that on? Yeah. I think the. Uh, controlling issue as far as the uh, water and sewer was the, the need for it and the realization that DeKalb County could make no progress, could not increase its its size very much, could not uh, provide an adequate fund for school without bringing water in and uh, making, it, making it available as fast as we could over the county. And I don't recall any uh, objections to that. Most people, as I, as, as I remember it, uh, were delighted to have the water service. Oh, yeah. I, I just was thinking it was interesting that when the plan of improvement took place, the city of Atlanta expands into Buckhead and also into Cascade Heights and in that area. But it doesn't, there's really no discussion of moving east into the... I don't believe it was. I, if there was any discussion about that, I don't recall it. Any idea why that might be? Well, you had... Uh, now, the city of Atlanta did move at some time. I think it was before this. So uh -huh. There were three cities or towns between... The kid in Atlanta, uh, up and down the Georgia Road Railroad, and a little south of that, uh, Edgewood was the first one. It uh, joined Atlanta. Well, Atlanta took Edgewood over a, a number of years yeah, ago, early 20th century, without any right. any problem. Then they moved to Kirkwood. Mm -hmm. They took Kirkwood over, and then there was a little town called East Lake, very small community. They took it over. And so Atlanta moved into that part of DeKalb County without any real objections from the county mm -hmm. that I know of. And uh, that's just about it. How, how has sort of the status of those people who have been in Atlanta and DeKalb changed over the years? Or how did it change? Well, you've had a considerable change in the southern part of that area, south of the Georgia Railroad, uh, it was, well, Edgewood had a sizable black population, but uh, <clears throat> Kirkwood was, I guess, 90% white, mm -hmm. and uh, now uh, there's a large black population in both Edgewood, Kirkwood, Eastlake, and it's moved all the way uh, Eastward toward uh, toward Lithonia. Right. right. And now there's there's also a considerable integration in the northern part of the county. I hardly any uh, substantial uh, apartment project. You won't find you'll find both both races in it. Mm -hmm. There seems to be no problem. On Long Buford Highway, you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, Buford Highway. Uh, there's some apartments out here at Emory Woods, uh, just on Claremont and North Kier Road. Sure. I think there's some there. I know there's some around Snow Mountain, mm -hmm. in which they live in the same partner house without any trouble. I know. I noticed that in 1960-61, uh, you made a speech somewhere saying that the public schools must be kept open, uh, sort of following the lines of the Civil Commission, I guess. Yes. Uh, I just was curious how you arrived at that at that position at a time when a lot of politicians, a lot of public figures were advocating something different. Well, first place, <coughs> I never did quite consider myself a politician. I, <laughs> I, 
I ran for the legislature and was elected for one term. And I decided during that term that if I was going to get in the le legislation passed that I wanted, I'd have to vote for too much bad legislation that other legislators wanted. And I got out, and since then I have had no political ambitions at all. Now, excuse me, what was your question? I got off on that. Uh, my question was how you arrived at your position concerning oh. open schools. Well, there just didn't seem to be any any other answer to it. In fact, I, I'm I'm confident now that that we just got to learn to live together, and uh, we can't uh, we're not going to ever have uh, segregation like it was in the past, and we've got to accept that and. Uh, I think that our schools have been hurt some, what, by the segregation, because uh, you bring a, a lot of people in that into a system that that hasn't been used to a, a first-class system with a lot of with, with emphasis on education. Mm -hmm and you have to try to bring them along, it, it has some effect on the general education. Sure. But uh, there's, no, there's just no other answer for it. You, you, the segregation days are over. During your 30 years, or 20 years rather, as county attorney, to what degree did the, the race issue ever come into play? I don't know, but one time, and that was when Mr. Candler was mayor, of Nikita, that there was anything that ever happened except this one thing. The Q Klux Klan undertook to organize a march in robes from Atlanta to Stone Mountain. When they reached the boundary, the west boundary of Nikita, Mr. Candle and some policemen were there and told them that they couldn't march through the kid, hooded with robes on. And they had to go around the kid to get huh. stone high. It's quite a detour. Uh, he, he's, he's been accused of being uh, racist, but that happened a long time before the race issue came up. When was that, in the 30s? Or? In the 30s. Okay. Well, let's see, no, it had been in the 40s. In the 40s. Wait a minute. No, he was in mayor of Decatur then. Okay. It was in the 30s. Okay. Were you privy to that? In no, I didn't know anything about it. I just knew of it. Now, getting back to Mr. Candler, I'm interested in sort of the evolution of uh, the DeKalb Civic League and sort of how he eventually uh, was defeated in the 1950s, what the issues were and how that, how that happened after he had, you know, in effect been the number one man in the county for 15 years. Well, I think almost anybody that has been has made all the, has made all the decisions affecting the government of the county over a period like that would be likely to be defeated. Uh, if there's any one thing I think that Scott did uh, that uh, uh, helped it, he 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 wanted to do what he could for for the people in the county. And he would promise to do things that he uh, would take a long time getting to. And people would get aggravated <laughs> and put out. He'd promise to extend the water line somewhere or to uh, pave a road. Uh, and he just, he was doing all he could do, but he just couldn't get to all the things. And those people and others who were just naturally wanted a, a different a voice in the government of the county uh, combined to I was I was extremely surprised because I I just uh, felt sure that with all that he'd accomplished in the county that he, he would be elected but that was that was it and he man the, the issue was the one man commissioner too. one man commissioner that's right there, it's 
that's been true all over the state. You see, the state government, all the counties, were originally governed by the ordinary. Uh, the superior court handles the cases of litigation. The ordinary court would handle the uh, administration of estates and things of that kind, wills, probate of wills, and so forth, and the local government. There's still some ordinaries that are running governments, I think, up in North Georgia. And uh, gradually evolved, and more and more counties wanted a multiple form of government, multiple form of government. And uh, DeKalb was one of the few, probably only large county that did not have a multiple form of government. And so that was promised, and they, uh, they'd feed them. What do you recall about that particular campaign, as it were? I don't recall anything in particular. It was a, just the usual political campaign. Uh, people, I don't know whether the man who defeated him did, but he, he was called the Czar, the Cab County Czar, and things of that kind. And, I uh, saw it mentioned somewhere that the theory, the theory that he had brought jobs into the county, which had brought individuals who weren't familiar with his past and his uh, contributions to the county. That, that may have had something to do with it. I expect it did. So who composed this, I guess it was called the DeKalb Civic League? Was that the name of the group that opposed him? I don't remember. Okay. In, in fact, I, I, I don't remember. I knew the man who was elected, uh, oh, was. Sweet Williams. Right. And, uh, he had been he had been superintendent of the junior high school in Decatur, and for a short time was executive manager of the Decatur. It was the Decatur Building Loan Association then. Mm -hmm. But uh, and then he, after he left Decatur, our association he. Uh, in the real estate business. Mm -hmm. He knew a lot of people. He was well known over the county, a good speaker. And there's nothing much you could say against him. And you're saying that Scott really didn't anticipate that the opposition was so great? No, they had barbecues for him all over the county. <laughs> a lot of people came and ate the barbecue in both against him. Right, right. I've heard that. One. <laughs> uh, did the media play any role in that particular campaign? I don't recall it. Okay. Okay. And is that why you left uh, the practice of law or you no, left no. the position of county attorney? No, I continued to practice law after then. And it's two, three years later, okay. the president of the association wanted to retire. And uh, the board asked me to take it over. And I had, by that time, created the firm, had some lawyers that could continue to practice on. Sure. And I thought that might be a kind of nice way to retire and take it a little bit easier. And become the president of the Savings and Loan Association. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's a heck of a retirement. <laughs> um, and then, of course, Scott went almost immediately from there to the Stone Mountain Memorial Association, or shortly there afterwards. Scott had one or two jobs. It was the RFC in in business? He was he was a yeah, Georgia right. manager for the RFC at one right. time. Right. Now that might have been back during the depression. Yeah. Before he was commissioner, and uh, then he was he did serve as a Georgia. As manager of the state park, Mount Show Mountain Park. Right, right. And then he came back out and had an office upstairs here for a while. That's right, sure. Uh, okay. I don't think he ever got back to the practice of law. Either. So, did the county immediately have a multiple commission, multiple member commission right after the defeat? Two years. Mr. Williams just served two years. It was a four year term. Yeah. He just served two years, and the legislature passed a law providing for multiple commission government, five men. Specifically in DeKalb County. In DeKalb okay. County. And uh, 
his local law, and uh, in the election, Claude Blunt was elected as a as a chairman. What, what is his name? Claude Blunt. Okay. He was had been the manager of the Decatur office of the First National Bank. Right. And I don't. Some of the others that served were Clark Harrison. Well, Clark Harrison that served later. He wasn't the first one in the first group. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I name name them. My memory is good. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, who introduced that legislation? How did that legislation come about? The I don't remember who the legislature was. Was it somebody from DeKalb? Yeah, there was somebody from DeKalb. Okay. Okay. Was it could James Mackey, Jimmy Mackey? I uh, expect Jim, Jim was uh, on that. Okay. He, now, he said a long time in the legislature. Right. Mac Porter might have been on. He was the DeKalb, Ed of DeKalb New Era. Okay. And that's the same Guy thing. Rutland Jr. might have been on. Okay. He served for a long time. Which Mac Porter is this one? The same Matt, or is it? No, that's a, this is Hugh Mac Porter, who okay. is the president of DeKalb New Era. Right, okay. He's editor and manager of it. Now, there's a lot of talk over the years going up, I guess, into, 19, into the 1970s about the conversion of DeKalb County into a city, you know, the development of an urban county or a metropolitan county. Maybe you could describe some of the reason for doing that and the, you know, some of that process. That's been discussed from time to time. I don't think it's ever had any real uh, serious support. Okay. They, and the only thing I think might be accomplished would be maybe some reduction in in uh, cost. You eliminate duplication. You don't have to pay but one governing official uh, or governing officials. I guess some increased federal revenues, perhaps. Might be. Uh -huh. Or. Um But that was that. Did you and Scott ever float that no, kind of idea? No. Okay. No, I don't think that was ever discussed, as far as I remember. Okay. Okay. Um, There's been a problem too because uh, Atlanta extended into the cab, and I'm, I expect the cab Atlanta would oppose any. See, that would taking that much property out of the cat, out of Atlanta. Out of the city of Atlanta. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you expect that, do you recall specific episodes of opposition coming from Atlanta to that kind of no. a, uh -uh. to that kind of a sound? No, I don't. When I turned over the tape, there was something that just pulled yeah. Um How did you all deal with uh, the question of duplication of services for Atlanta and DeKalb? Well, I don't think there was ever any, I don't recall there ever any question. Uh, we provide the same service in Atlanta that we provided to the citizens of Decatur, the citizens of Clarkson, Stone Mountain. And uh, that meant that uh, the police department would call, answer calls in those towns on request for the uh, police officer of the, of the town, and uh, we got to the water systems and connected up with them as fast as they wanted. Of course, there, several of those had their own water systems, and they were, but they were all insufficient, and so they were glad to get the water system. So the, I don't know of any duplication of services you have. What about fire or? S the same situation. if. If the fire is too big for the local uh, fire departments to handle, then they, they'd call on the county. Uh, I don't know that Atlanta ever did that, but they had that right. Okay, and sanitation? Well, I believe sanitation is handled, the collection of garbage is handled by all the municipal municipalities. And then the county hands it uh, for the citizens outside the municipality. Okay. That's my recollection. So that was basically the procedure that the city of Atlanta would handle the first, sort of the first level of services, yeah. and then uh, if need be, then DeKalb would come Supplement. in. Supplement. Supplement, okay. Mm -hmm. And 
there you don't recall any kind of conflict about that kind of arrangement no. or anything. No, I tell you, the relationships between the Cab County and Atlanta have always been fairly good. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, then I know that this is moving moving along a little bit. I know that uh, at some point, I think in the '60s, you were head of. Uh, uh, Georgia Judicial Studies Commission. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I was asked to attend a Georgia Bar meeting. That was after I retired from law practice. And they were discuss, discussing, and the g general feeling among the bar members was that they would like to improve on the, on the selection of, of the appellate courts judges and they wanted somebody who understood the law who had practiced law but was not active at that time to serve as chairman and so I finally agreed to serve in that capacity uh, I had a 10 or 12 man committee uh, from over the state <coughs> Mr. John Sibley was one of the members. Right, it's on Ms. Grace Hamilton was right. one. I don't remember the others at the present time. But our effort was mainly in trying to get the people to understand uh, the reasons why a court appointed, uh, an appointed judiciary, a petted judiciary, would serve uh, better than one elected because very few people are able to judge the qualifications of a man seeking one of these courtships and uh, whereas a governor would select maybe three I believe and submit, submit that to the Senate let them select a the appellate court judge that they thought was best qualified. Mm -hmm. Some 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 proposal like that where you could really study the qualifications of the lawyer who was being considered for a judgeship rather than just when you when you elect when the judge is elected by uh, the general pop population Nine, not, nine times out of ten, the man whose name begins with A is going to get a, more votes because they just vote for the first man on the, on the list. They don't, they don't go into the qualifications. They don't really have a way to go into the qualifications. Whereas a, a small number of people would be able to, to give it study. But I... The people themselves don't want to give up the right to election. It's it's uh, it's going to be a hard right. thing to, to say. Uh, That's uh, right. So you all made these recommendations at the end of the study, yes. and uh, with what effect? Well, it, following that, the legislature appointed a commission, and I think Robin Harris has. It. And they did incorporate some of the recommendations we made. Now, I can't tell you which one. Right. But uh, they have made some changes in the appellate procedure. <clears throat> was, was Robin something of a uh, protege of yours here at the, at the, at the, at the Savings and Loan Association? Well. So how did he come into public life? After. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I started my practice in 1927, 1926, and uh, just an individual, uh, and continued that practice on until after the war. At that time, there was a, a tremendous increase in the number of houses that were being built, the number of people that were moving in, and we also we're getting in a lot more money into the association. And I felt a need then to try to get somebody to help carry the administrative load. And uh, I first asked Scott Candler, Jr., 
he had just come back from the war, and he joined me, and we practiced for a while on the name of McCurdy and Cameron. Then uh, we still needed somebody else, and Scotty and I talked it over, and Scotty told me about Robin. I hadn't known him, that uh, he had finished top man in his class, and he'd served during the war, and we was having a right difficult time getting the practice started because he was, he was a grandson, a great-grandson of George Chandler Harris, but he wasn't well known in the, in the county. So we asked him if he'd come in and join us, so we formed the firm of Curtis Cannon Harris sometime before 1950. And when I decided to take it a little bit easier at the association and become chairman of the board, uh, I recommended Robin Harris to the board. I talked to him first, and he agreed to accept it. And I think he's made a very good executive officer down there. Was that before or after he entered the legislature himself? Oh, it was. Uh, he first, his first local office was, I think, a commissioner in, in Decatur, mm -hmm. and uh, then an opening, I thought it was going to be an opening for the legislature, and I suggested to Robin that he might think about running. <laughs> and right at the last minute, Guy Rutland Jr. in it, and Guy was well known all over the county, and Guy beat Robin that first time. Okay. but. Uh, he came back, and he said, I guess, 10, 12 years up then, had gained the uh, uh, respect of the other members, and he does have, he, they're intelligent. And uh, so, to that extent, I may have been, I encouraged him. Right. That he, I got gotcha. you. Um. Okay, we've talked about sort of relationships with the city of Atlanta up to a point, but as we go into the 50s and 60s, how do those relationships between DeKalb County and other governments, you know, how do they grow in complexity? Uh, how do they increase? Well, I haven't kept uh, in close touch with the problems of the county since since I sort of got out of the picture. Right. But I have not heard of any serious problems. No, I'm not even talking about problems. I'm just talking about I, the I, ways that governments involve, yeah. itself, involve themselves with each other. Um, you know, well, uh, the, the only way I know is that it seems to me that uh, uh, Mr. Maloof has, has, he's been commissioned, I guess, longer than some of the other that uh, they have been able to develop ideas and work together in common undertaking without any, any serious problem. Was there any, any concept of, quote, regional planning at the time that you were still close to the county government? No. I, I believe Miami was the first one that I know anything about. I'm not sure just when that, and I I can recall thinking about it and considering it, but I don't even know whether I ever talked to Mr. Cannon about it. Uh, I I can see some advantages to it, but uh, as long as people want it, it 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 would save some money, but as long as the people want to have their own government. They want to pay for it. I don't see the reason why they, we ought to fuss about it. You were certainly around, it seems to me, at the time that the interstates were being built. Yeah. Maybe you can recall what I that see. entailed here. Well, about the only thing I can recall, most of them have been built since I was out. The Stone Mountain Memorial Drive mm -hmm. was built first as a two-lane road. And uh, 
then the state decided to widen it. And Ms. I think it was Ms. Johnson had a program of beautification of highways. Lady Bird Johnson. Right. And uh, so they were going to maybe take another 100 feet on each side. I had the problem as county attorney of trying to get the right of way. And I told all the people down there how beautiful this drive was going to be. <laughs> uh, we, we negotiated, in most cases, in bought the land. But one or two went, had, had to go to uh, condemnation. But <laughs> it's turned in, I turned out to be a terrible liar because my mother drive is the worst looking street I think we've got in the, in the county. And, <laughs> and the most dangerous one. Right. So that, that that sounds like an unenviable task That's to right. go out and be the person to have to convince Now, people. I believe all the highways uh, in the state have been built since I was out. Okay. Somebody else had that problem. Okay. Do you have any insight as to the, as to the development of MARTA out this way and the acceptance of MARTA and, and sort of... Uh, MARTA has been accepted. Uh, a lot of people are dissatisfied with the location of this station in Decatur. Right. And I, I thought when they came out, they were going to follow the railroad and stay just on this side of the railroad. Uh, but I think Agnes Scott objected to that and some others objected to it, so they brought it right through Decatur. And then on top of that, they bring in a lot of the buses from outside, so it's sort of jammed up traffic. Right. around Church Street and, and uh, Sycamore. Yeah. Uh, seems to me it would be better if some of those buses were uh, went to Avondale or to East Lake. I think the only answer we've got to our, our traffic problems is, is just more and more. Uh, I don't see any other way to... We're gonna, we ain't going to be able to build roads one of these days. They, uh, they, they're becoming so expensive to first just to acquire the rights away. Um, traffic at we, all? This Lawrenceville Highway has just been widened from here to Lawrenceville. And I would be interested in knowing just what the figure it was that whole program cost. Mm -hmm. I'm serving a good purpose. But it's costly. Mm -hmm. Was traffic at all an issue or a problem during your years with the county? No. We had, uh, we, we built some roads and uh, extended some, maybe widened some, but we didn't have any real serious problems. In fact, wasn't that Scott's title, Commissioner of Roads and Revenue? Yeah. Uh, did it, was that his title throughout the term that he served? Yeah. was called mm -hmm. Commissioner of Roads and Revenue. Commissioner of Roads and Revenue. I think the original act that created it, and that was that was, was passed, I guess, either in the early 1900s or before 1900. Speaking of revenue, you've mentioned various bond issues that did pass. Uh, were there any that didn't pass here ever during the time that you were there? No. Every single one passed. Mm -hmm. okay. Were there any ones that were more? Every one building you could, I sent by, but that's right. Yeah, passed. That's right. This, School issues have always bad. Any that had any serious opposition? No, I don't think so. You always have a little bit. But uh, I gather with the sewer issue, there was uh, some tension maybe or differences between the city of Avondale um, and one other place, I guess. Uh, I guess city of Decatur, too, had some questions about the countywide sewer system. Mm -hmm. Well, well what exactly were those? Well, uh, I'm that they continued to maintain their own sewage system or something? No, uh, uh, they were eventually merged into the county system, uh, Decatur and Avondale. And I think uh, every other community right. that I know. That was after you filed suit, though, is that not right? What suit was that? that they were dumping sewage then that it was affecting the cab water supply. So well, I don't remember that. that. I guess okay. I did, but I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I saw some mention yeah. of that. 
That's almost all I wanted to talk with. I know I wanted to mention the different congressmen who came out of DeKalb County because there certainly have been a lot of them. Yeah, they have. Uh, going back to Congressman Howard, I guess. William Fly Howard. Yeah. He was a colorful character. He lived in a home up here on College Avenue, just this side of East Lake Drive. Uh -huh. And uh, then uh, succeeding him, was um, Lester Steele? No, not from the cab. Was the prohibition? <laughs> we were the uh, Upshaw. Upshaw, Willie Upshaw. Uh, you see, the fifth congressional district at that time in included Fulton, the cab. Rockdale, possibly Clayton, and Camel County. Right. And uh, uh, the county unit system was in effect. And so Willie Upshaw could carry the uh, these outlying counties without any difficulty at all, and he was right difficult to beat. And I, I, they, they changed to the popular vote, and I think the first uh, was Helen Douglas Mankin, right? Mankin, right? And uh, then Leslie Steele. I think I'm getting Jim, this Jim Davis. Jim oh wait a minute! No, uh, Helen du uh, Steele was for Davis, uh, Davis, and then Robert Ramsbeck. Ram Wait a minute, Ram Speck was right. first, right. and then then David. Well, Mankin with the with a brief Mankin for that one one term. special election, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, let's see, we got down through David, didn't? We? And then it was uh, Mackey, wasn't it? No, it's Steele. Then. Okay, Steele was then, and then. Mackey. And then it was split. Yeah. yeah. Um, going back to some of those elections, I know Miss Doug Miss Mankin, Helen Douglas Mankin runs after Mr. Ramsbeck steps down and there's that famous race in nineteen forty six, the special election with Tom Camp and Oh yeah. Helen Mankin. Uh -huh. Do you remember anything about that race? No, I don't. I, I remember it now since you mentioned it, but I've forgotten about it. The one thing that I was recalling about that race is that was one of the first times that blacks could register oh. and vote. Uh -huh. Do you recall anything of that indicator? No, I don't. Of course, blacks have always been allowed to vote if they've kept the poll tax it paid up. Uh, the, the only reason blacks would uh, disfranchise was because they didn't pay the poll tax. And if you didn't pay your poll, you a dollar a year, and of course the interest accumulated on it. Right? And you, you, you kept buying it up to quite a sizable amount. Okay. Uh, well, maybe let me ask you, when do you recall any significant number of uh, black residents of DeKalb voting? Primarily, I'd say since 1960. Okay. okay. Well, now, there, there's always been, there's always been some mm -hmm. uh, that voted. I, I think I recall when my father was elected chair, he had some votes. Really? Okay. That was in 20, 1930. All right. Well, there were a few mm -hmm. at that time. Do you remember anything about the uh, 1954 congressional race between uh, Morris Abram and, and Judge Davis? Well, that, 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 that was the typical, I guess, liberal conservative uh, difference. Morris was quite liberal, and Judge Davis was an ultra conservative. And the race question might have had something to do in that. Getting to the county unit system. How, if it, if it all, was DeKalb County ever affected by the county unit system? Well, 
Uh, of course, Cap the Cap County was a neighbor to elect congressman for one thing. Uh, otherwise, I don't I don't recall any. Unable to elect a congressman, you're saying? No, they were able to. They elect were a congressman. rather than Fulton County. You're rather saying. than Fulton. Uh, uh, let's go back. Okay. What was your question? I was going to say how ha how did the county unit system affect the Cab County? Well, it, the, it decreased the, the uh, no, it, it didn't, the county unit system uh, would somewhat increase the power of the Cab County. Relative to Atlanta? Relative to Atlanta. Okay. That's, that's about all I okay. know. Okay. Um, were there any disappointments that you and Scott had uh, during your time together, working together at the county. Let me think a minute, cut it off. Okay, sure. We were a little disappointed that uh, we were unable to maybe work out a plan where the county could develop the memorial park. But today we finally recognize there wasn't any way to do that. Uh, the expense and all would have been too, too much for the county. And so we never tried. Okay. But he did buy some land in, uh, with a thought in mind. Uh, uh, Mr. Metz, Charles Metz, all the time, uh, on the right side of the tract of land, right in front of the monument. And uh, I think we bought that. And then the state bought it from us. That's about the only thing I can think of. We we worked together, and we, the times were good after the war, you That's know. Right. That's right. And uh, he was. He was extremely interested in getting the airport up there. Right. And uh, he'd gotten that worked out, and then the Navy took it over as soon as we got it, got it going, but we got it back now. And you were able to pay back some of your money with the reven the rent, the lease revenues from the Navy, right? Yes, uh -huh. that's right. It, it, it met the, the funding requirements. So in describing Scott Candler's sort of genius, and what he did. I mean, what are some of his attributes that really... Uh, well, if you want to turn that on, let me think just a minute. Well, I think one of the, some of the uh, positive attitudes that, that Scott had and were these. One, he was, he was devoted to the county. Uh, he had, he and his Forebears had lived here since the county was founded. And uh, he'd served for a number of years as mayor of Takeda. And while there was once or twice some difference of opinion there, he managed to keep everything moving along in Takeda and was responsible for uh, Takeda being, I think, such a good city. Uh, he had a lot of enthusiasm. He, he wanted to do what was what was best for the county after he became county commissioner. And he had a lot of foresight uh, in foreseeing the need for the water system and for some of the roads that uh, he built. And uh, the, uh, the help that he gave when he could to school. And he got in trouble one time by giving some help to the churches. Mm -hmm. He had a program that if a church wanted to help in building a parking lot around the church, he would he would do it. Well, of course, that was probably out of order. Dr. Lou Newton got on to him one time mm -hmm. about helping, helping pay like our own church a lot down there. Why, why, why would Dr. Newton get into it? Well, he just didn't think that was mixing up church and state. Okay. That's it. So, so 
I know that Scott was devoted to the churches, and the churches flourished while he was here. That's so right. he began to pave the parking lots. You're saying, and then <laughs> somebody, well, who would raise sand other than? Well, some somebody connected with that. I recall one day he and another social advisor had gone to Miami for some reason, and we were down there over the weekend, and the hotel we were staying in on. Saturday, he kept going to the state, pay t telephone. <clears throat> Finally, I asked him, I said, Scott, what are you doing? He said, I'm trying to find somebody to teach my damn Sunday school class. <laughs> he, he taught Sunday school, and, and it's still a class name for him over there, mm -hmm. for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, he's... He, he had a fine son, and he's got two fine grandsons, both of them in the law firm, right. all of them in the law firm. Right. Oh, as we're talking, are there any other stories like that, Scott Candler stories or DeKalb County stories that have come to mind or that you would like to sort of... You know, no, I don't with? think so. That's all I can think of. I just happen to remember that. Right. <laughs> I know that you were called the fixer, you know, that sometimes, <laughs> uh, what was the quote that... Uh, if it isn't legal, uh, Julius will make, make, sure it so. it, make it so. <laughs> yeah. He put me up. I'd had one or two problems like that. Not serious. Which which ones are you talking about? You have to do let me think. Okay. I've already mentioned that, and that is uh, when he had Country O'Neill by that uh, medical center over by the railroad. <laughs> I told him I didn't think, I thought he was stretching it a little bit, but he went on and it worked out all right. They kind of put you in a bind as yeah. the uh, attorney yeah. to defend the county. That's right. <laughs> okay. Then, in Wait sort a of minute, there's one other okay. thing that I think we differed on. The Chamber of Commerce years ago had a DeKalb County Fair, and it was held on uh, some property that adjoined the Panthersville School. And uh, they were promoted by the Chamber of Commerce and they wanted Scott to make a contribution from the county to it. And Scott had promised to do it. And he came to me to be about it and I said, Scott, you can't do that. You're not supposed to contribute public money to private undertaking. <laughs> he said, well, I've already done it now. So. <laughs> Nothing really came to pass no, after that. Uh, okay. No, I think everybody's doing it now, it looks like. Right. Uh, then, then in sort of the next generation of the Cab County leaders, after yourself and after Scott, obviously you've mentioned Robin Harris, but who are who are some of the key figures in county government in, in the county after sort of the next Well, Tom time? Calloway served as a county commissioner for a number of years. He was a a uh, very effective commissioner, uh, and has been a leader in the county. Bill Evans, who served as commissioner for several terms, and is now <coughs> is now chairman of the state highway board, and has been helpful to the county government here in getting some uh, roads mm -hmm. that were needed, and. Uh, Bob McMahon, who is a who is a, the next man to Robin Harris in the association, has been active in the Chamber of Commerce. Has been a leader. I can't think of any others right now. I know there are a lot of yeah, others. Sure, but I, those are those are just ones that come to mind. Of people I'm thinking about maybe contacting as we sort of pursue this whole line. Of Tom, I don't know whether you can get to Tom or not. He, he he would be able to bring you up to date on recent, more recent events. Callaway. Now, Bill Evans would be a good one to talk with. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in this building. Okay. Uh, William M. Evans is the mm -hmm. way it's listed. Uh, of course, I, I, neglect, I wish you'd put this back on. I'd like, I, I'd like to mention Jim Mackey. I don't know anybody that has been more concerned with uh, DeKalb County than 
in later years in jail. Uh, he's been extremely interested in the historical society. And he's just retired, right. or is retired right. at the end of the right. year from the law practice. And I have a great God for Jim. He, he was sort of a maverick in some ways, too, wasn't well, he? Well, Jim, in the beginning, he was, he was maybe a little too liberal, a little more liberal than some of the rest of us, but uh, there was never any real differences between us. Uh, I like Jim. I think he's, he's, he's Jim's just retiring. He's going to have a home up in North Georgia now. You cut it off from it. Is there anything? Let's see if I can think of anybody else. No, me too. H.G. Patil is one. Mm -hmm. The Rutland family, they are, they've continued following the father and great grandfather's footsteps. Mm -hmm. It just occurred to me one question I might want to ask you. Can you recall what county revenues were, say, in 1935 or 1940? Um, no, I can't. I had I had all that at one time. Okay. And um, but it's uh, it's all skipped my mind. I had the census figures in mind, and the county growth has been, really been phenomenal. If you start about 1920 and come down to date, let me show you something here that you might.